Thank you, CJ, for a little bit of education on, and that's true. A lot of times we sing songs about how depressed we are, and I need you, Lord, and we need strength and guidance. But sometimes when we just pause and praise the Lord, we find that the clouds are lifted and the presence of God is nearer than when we believe. I'm mindful that whenever I stand up to speak, that there are so many forces at work. And I want to pray this morning that our minds would be focused and our hearts would be tuned in to the Lord that we may hear what his spirit has to say to us today. Loving Father, gracious God, it is truly a blessing to be able to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. That's a fact. But Lord, today, help us to realize that we are called to be holy as the Lord is holy. To be the temple not made with brick and stones and wood, to be the abiding place of your holiness. Now speak to our hearts and minds, and I pray that you'll find fertile soil in the lives of those who hear what your spirit has to say. In Jesus' name, amen. A lot of times when I get a chance to look back at um, the sermons, I just periodically check them out on YouTube and I find out I'm shinier than a doornail. So uh, I'm going to have somebody work on me one day before I get up here. But if I'm shiny, I'm letting my light shine for the Lord. Amen. This, uh, I want to just start with a little basic conversation with you before I dive into the message to help you understand what's happening in my life. Sometimes God has to bring us to an event for help for us to recalibrate. That's a word I like to use, recalibrate. But you'll never know the blessing of that recalibration unless you get to that event. And how ironic it is in our world today, you know, when COVID hit, it took so many of us down a path that we didn't want to go down. Some got vaccinated, some didn't, some wore masks, some didn't. Some did everything they could only to realize that there's really nothing you can do to prevent yourself from getting COVID. And um, <laughs> confession is good for the soul, but hard on the reputation. And I had this struggle with barbecue potato chips. <laughs> I like barbecue potato chips. And my wife would always get the healthy ones. She said, these are baked. Uh, these are more natural than that. And I said, but there's nothing like Lay's barbecue potato chips. And so I'd periodically in the store, I'd in the checkout line at Walmart, and I'm almost there, just about to get the victory. And to my right, it's a bag of barbecue potato chips. And depending on where you buy them, like in a convenience store, maybe a gas station, they're like mid-size. Then sometimes they're really small with nothing but air. And you open it, there are four chips inside. <laughs> and then when you remember that, you go to Walmart and you get the family size. That lasts for two and a half days. And you realize, ooh, why am I so bloated? And I read the ingredients. And everything that was in the bag is unnatural. Some things that you cannot even pronunciate. And I remember I could hear in the back of my mind Dr. Hans Diel saying, if it doesn't come out of the ground, don't eat it. And in our minds, we try to reason, but it did come out of the ground. But it took a left turn and got a little bit of dressing but it did start on the ground. That's what we do to ourselves. Am I right? Come on, you know what I'm talking about? We reason ourselves into unhealthy practices. And then I started noticing my suits getting tighter and tighter and tighter. 
And I'm generally a 40 long, but then I started buying 42s to accommodate my potato chips. <laughs> and when COVID hit, God said, I need to get your attention. So COVID hit, and you know what happens with COVID. You don't eat, you don't really desire, and you start changing things. And after COVID, I went into my closet and pulled out a suit, and it was back to the size that I normally wear. I said, this is nice. I just gained like 28 more suits that I could wear. I must confess I have over 50 suits. But that was only because I'm visible all the time. Don't get nervous. And I thought, man, I could get back into my normal size. And here's one of them today. Come on, say amen, somebody. Help me out. So I thought, you know what? It's either all that money I spent for my suits and I can't wear them, or you got to go. <laughs> and I reasoned in my, okay, well, okay, let's do this at moderation since it's not one of those red things. It's not pork, it's not alcohol, it's not tobacco. So I am presently in the battle, like many of you. You see, God has an ideal, does he not? And we are, as a songwriter said, Somewhere between the hot and the cold, somewhere between the new and the old, somewhere between what I am and what I need to be, I'm somewhere in the middle. So this is not just about me talking to you, but I've discovered that if I talk to myself, you might learn something. And this sermon is a lot about talking to myself but also including you in the conversation. And it reminded me that we are supposed to be, above all other Christians, the healthiest. And the question is, why aren't we? Because we know what God's ideal is. And many years ago, I remember when Dr. John McDougall came out and the whole world praised John MacDougall. You may not know who that is. And then Dr. Esselstein and a number of other people. Then the Fork Over Knives and all these other wonderful videos came out. And people started saying, wow, what great, massively beautiful information. Only to realize we had it before some of them were born. And are not doing with it what we should. Thank you, Jasmine, for pulling our coattails here in Thompsonville. Keep on doing that. Because we need to be a people that remember that although we are going to get new bodies, we cannot serve God while we're sick and almost dead. We've got to be the best we can be. And you know what? Time takes its toll. Come on, say amen somebody. I'm not going to be as fit as I was when I was 27 or 30 or 45. And that's all I'm going to tell you about my age. But we can be the best that we can be, right? And that requires some effort on our part. I don't want to be just a person who believes a message. I want to be a person who focuses on that ideal. And as Paul said, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And I told you that when we got to Australia a number of years ago, we were in customs, and the customs officer said, do you have any medication to declare? I said, no. He looked at my wife. Do you have any medication to declare? She said, no. He said, I'm going to ask you one more time. Do you have any medication to declare? We said, no. He said, everybody from America has medication to declare. And I said, we don't. And I said, praise God, we don't need medication. Now, it may happen for other reasons. But my knees ain't hurting. My back is only hurting because I'm a tall man. I have tall man's disease. My ful fulcrum point, I need to go back and do my sit-ups and push-ups and get my arms strong. You know, when you start picking up stuff that never used to be heavy and it starts getting heavy, that means time to get back in the gym. God wants us to be healthy. And so this is about this beautiful temple God has given to us. 
this, this car, this vehicle that's worth more than the most beautiful Bentley, the most ostentatious Lamborghini, the most sparkling Ferrari or Mercedes. We only got one, and God wants us to be the best we can be so we can be fit to carry the gospel. Because Paul the Apostle says, physical exercise profits little. If you just want to be healthy for the sake of being healthy and you sit home, you wasted your time. But if you want to be healthy so that you can be fit to carry the gospel for the Lord, then you have done it the way that God intends. Now I say again, God's plan is the ideal. But thank the Lord for his grace. Because we won't always reach the ideal, but we must, must harmonize with those principles and scriptures that we know are in the red category, to leave it alone, the yellow category, to back away a little bit, and the green category, you'll never hear anybody say, oh, I'm having a broccoli attack. <laughs> you never hear anybody say, I need a carrot, I'm leaving the room to get a carrot. Because God created those things for our bodies to respond. You can't eat too many carrots and end up in the emergency room. Now, you might start turning orange, but you can't eat, you can't go to, you know, emergency room. Oh, he ate four carrots. Get him some oxygen. That's not going to happen. But there are certain scriptures that when we give ourselves to Christ, when we say, you are my God and I'm your son, he says, now, son, don't just walk with me. I want you to learn the way that I walk. Amen, somebody? Amen. So there's an ideal, and we may not always be at the ideal, but I want us to be able to move in the direction of God's ideal so that we don't be stagnant wondering why people that... You know what amazes me? There are people that don't even mention God. They're atheists. They're nonbelievers. They're agnostics. There are Satan worshipers that are healthier than some of us. Because vegan, 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 vegan is popping up all over the place. But let me make a point. You don't get to heaven because you're vegan. You get to heaven because Jesus is your Savior and he's forgiven your sins. The lifestyle is not the salvation. However, you can hinder your salvation by ignoring the counsel of God. All right, that's the preamble. I didn't start preaching yet. Start counting from now. The Apostle Paul is going to be in the sermon today, but we're going to begin with 2 Chronicles, the scripture reading for today, and I'd like you to read it with me. And the message today is entitled, Rebuilding the Temple. What is the message today? Rebuilding, Rebuilding the Temple. You should get a chance to read the story when Solomon decided to build a temple to the glory of God. Wow! It will make you sit back and realize that there's nothing built today that was as ostentatious and as glorious as the temple that Solomon was going to build for the Lord. The only problem is today we still call it Solomon's temple. We don't call it God's temple because somewhere along the way, Solomon says, I need me one of those. And he built himself a house also. But Solomon, in 2 Chronicles 2 verse 5, the Bible says, together... And the temple which I will, which I build will be what? Great. For our God is what? Greater than all gods. Today, my brothers and sisters, I'm challenging you to build a temple. Rebuild your temple because the God you serve is greater than all gods. The God we serve is greater than all gods. And it should be at least be a part of the way we live, not just doctrinally, but physically. When Solomon made that statement, his focus was on building God a temple. And when you study the pages of antiquity, Solomon built a temple that amazed the kings of all the surrounding nations. He left nothing to chance. He worked on every possible detail. And when people came to Solomon's, the golden porches, the, the hanging plants, 
the, the artesian wells, the, the kind of material he used just dazzled the mind of those who came to visit, man, visit him. And before they heard about his wisdom, they saw the greatness of the God that he served. And when I read about that, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be wonderful that when we go to hospital or go to places, like I, I, I was at the, periodically I go get, go get checks, uh, checkups, you know, checkup to make sure everything is doing well, and um, getting a checkup, I had stayed away from this physician too long, so they had me fill out a new form. You know those forms when you go to the doctor, Ramona? They give you all these new pages. They say, well, we know you've been here before, but we've changed our system. So they give you like 11 pages. And you sit in the waiting room like, what are, what are they not going to ask me? And then you go on that page with all the ailments. Do you have rickets, crickets? Are you hydrophobia, claustrophobia? Are you afraid of the dark? Are you afraid of the light? I mean, they ask you all, do you have cancer? It, that means put all these things, and when you finish filling that out, you thought, I did not know there were so many things that people struggle with. Come on in, Mark. You can come on in. You just sneak on in. I had to point him out. Come on in, Mark. We love you. <laughs> so I went through those five pages of all, do you have, do you have, do you have, check, check, check. And I walked up to the counter, and the nurse flipped up. She said, my goodness, at least you could have picked one of them. <laughs> I said, I don't have any of that stuff. Yeah. Amen? Amen? I don't have any of that stuff. She says, and what's your date of birth? That really does. When I give up my date of birth, she looks up like, and you don't have anything? No. I want to... If I go to my grave, I want to be like Abraham. I want to be like Moses with none of my health, with none of my strength abated. If I die, I want to die of old age. And my prayer is, Lord, if everything else breaks down, just give me my mind. Anybody ever say that? I don't want to be walking around saying stuff that nobody understands. I'm saying that very respectfully because some of my family members have gone through that, and nothing is more challenging than a person you love locked into this shell that you know they're there. And, and, and health and disease have done its part. So I say that without even belittling that. But I'm praying, God, I want to be like Pastor Turner. 102 and still standing up. Amen? That's a testament. Now, some of us came into this message later on in life. Some of, them, some of us were not raised in Adventist homes. So we were well in our 20s, 30s, 40s, some 50s when we heard about this message. So we're now trying to undo and rebuild all that stuff that we never heard about. God understands. Some people smoke for 35 years, 40 years, and all of a sudden they quit, and then they got to clear all that out. God understands. So we won't always get to the ideal, but the good news is one day we won't have to worry about hospitals or medication ever again. So, so, when, so when Solomon decided to build this temple, I thought about it, and I said, Solomon, what a temple you built. But I want to say today, nothing, Solomon's temple cannot compare with this prototype that God built called John Loma Kang. You know, there are no two John Loma Kangs on the planet. Help me out, somebody. There's not enough room in the world for two people like me. I wouldn't want another guy like me walking around the planet. And you know what? Each one of us is a prototype. Eric, aren't you glad your wife is not like you? And Abby, you don't have to say anything, but I know you're glad you're not like Eric. But you love each other. Every one of us is different. We must appreciate all of our differences. But God, when God made you, there was no second person like you. Your fingerprint is unique to you. And we're going to talk about all that today. Your DNA, all these different things. 
So when Solomon decided to build a temple, God said, Solomon, do your best, but you'll never be able to build a Solomon. You'll get that on Tuesday. When Solomon built the temple, he didn't know the scripture, but we know it. The Apostle Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, and this is the King James Version. And I like what he starts with, because Paul is flabbergasted that the Corinthians don't know this. He says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? What? Which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. Why? Because God saw us on the, on the trash heap of Satan and bought us back. Come on, say amen. For ye are bought with a price. This is the part that many Christians miss. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. When you read what the Apostle Paul says, we need to abandon the idea, Robbie D., that we belong to ourselves. We don't belong to us any more than our car takes us where it wants us to go. I know you turn that car on real quick, Mary Kay, if on the way home your car decides to drive you down to Southern California. God has given us the best owner's manual, his word. And if we simply follow it, as he said to the children of Israel, if you do what I've asked you to do, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians. And by the way, when they studied the sarcophaguses that they unearthed there in Cairo, Egypt, they discover that many of the things that the Egyptian dynasty kings died of are things that people suffer from today. Heart disease, arteriosclerosis, all these bone arthritis, yes, all these diseases, they're not unique to Egyptians. These diseases are unique to people that don't follow God's plan. And I said, many of you come into this and age takes this role. Sometimes age will catch you no matter what medication you get. Arthritis is going to move in. But when you think about how much Paul talks about the body being the temple, when you think about how much Solomon paid or put into building God's temple, all the wealth that went in there, the question begs to ask, how much did God pay to build us? Peter says it this way, 1 Peter 1, verse 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with what? Corruptible things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Come on, say amen. Jesus didn't ask for an auto loan to build us. He put the best in building me. Sometimes I know sin and all the practices of my mom and dad. I was raised by two non-Christians. Later on, my mom got baptized, and uh, she died in the faith. I met her after 26 years. She smoked two to three packs of cigarettes a day. She was an alcoholic, largely due to the decisions she made to abandon her children. She dealt with the mental guilt of these things and tried to sedate herself with all the chemicals of life until the day she found the Lord. And when we finally met, the, this phrase freed her. Mom, I forgive you. She discovered at that moment she no longer needed any chemicals to inebriate her from the pain of her decisions. And I said, Mom, pray for God to deliver you. And she went and prayed, had a pastor pray for her there in the Virgin Islands in St. Thomas. She called me one day when we were living in the Northern California area up in the mountains, and she said, I'm on my way to visit you. And I thought, wow, 
How am I going to deal with two to three packs of cigarettes a day? Alcohol. My mom, in her own words, said, I have at least seven demons in my life, and I'm coming to move in with you? I thought, how is this going to work? Oh, by the way, she said, I've got one more thing to tell you. Remember you told me to pray for God to deliver me? I said, yes, I, I, I told you to pray for that. She said, I want you to know six months ago I had a pastor pray for me. And since he prayed for me, I haven't had the desire for alcohol or cigarettes since. Amen. And I noticed her voice was lighter, sounded softer. You know that smoker's voice? Amen. Sounded lighter. She said, oh, but I got one more thing that I hope you don't mind. She said, when I met you, I was about a size one. I'm a size 10 now. Is that okay? I said, mom, you'll fit. <laughs> and when I met my mom, she was the picture of health. Her cheeks were rosy, no pun intended, because her name was Rosario. They call her Rosie in family. Rosario Maria Lomacan. There I met her in Redding, California, the picture of health. Voice clean. She said, I don't even have a desire. And my sister, the same thing. When my sister got a new kidney, they said, you will either kill this kidney or this kidney will survive. But we're not going to give you this kidney if you're going to smoke. She quit cold turkey. And she said, I don't even like the smell of cigarettes. I don't even let my friends smoke in my car. And if they come to visit me, go out on the balcony and smoke. Don't smoke around me. See, the body is built in such a way that when you decide that this is God's temple, brothers and sisters, and those of you that are listening and watching, God can do a work in you to help rebuild that temple to his glory and honor. But you got to want to. But we don't belong to ourselves. And when you consider how beautiful we can be and that our bodies are under a satanic attack, all we need to do is pause and ask the question, how much are we worth in the sight of God? And what blueprint did God use to build us? The Bible answers the question. The blueprint that God used to build us. When I thought about it in that way, I thought, wow. I really am unique, Ron, Donna. God, look at the blueprint he used to build us. Genesis 1:27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Let's make no mistake about how the text ends. Male and female, he created them. That's how we were made. And any alteration is a violation of the blueprint who is God. God is your blueprint, Mark. There's no two Marks on the planet. There's no two Lonnie's on the planet. There are no two Brian's or Celestine's on the planet. There are no two Timothy's, second Timothy's. We don't have room in our church for two Timothy's that side. <laughs> My bodyguard. There is no body like you. Right, honey? There are no two answers like that. You know, years ago, a lot of friends of mine said, man, I want to get me a wife like yours. I said, well, don't think about mine because she's already taken. <laughs> so a good friend, the pastor of mine, he said, I finally got me an Angie. And his wife was standing right there, and her name is not Angie. I said, <laughs> he said, I finally found me an Angie. Praise God, I've been blessed with an Angie, Angel A. Love you, honey. But God loved us so much, my brothers and sisters. I want you to grab this. He didn't go to Ford or Mercedes or General Motors or Honda for that matter. He said, there is nothing that man can write down for me that's going to be good enough for the prototypes I'm going to make. Hmm. I think I will use myself as the blueprint. Come on, say amen, somebody. You are the result of God, the blueprint. Jason, you're God's blueprint. Jason and I had a chance to visit 
last week on Sunday out in the yard, appreciating his journey, because God said, Jason, I made you because I'm your blueprint. Kevin, God made you because he is your blueprint. He's got plans for you to be just like him. We are all God's blueprint. No wonder the body is under such attack today. If you think about the way the body is being abused, that's going to be my third part to this sermon. Today I'm talking about the health aspect. But when we consider the function of the body, it's fascinating. When we reflect on the abilities we have, we possess, above all other created things, the inventive capacity to conceive things. This came from a mind. The mind that God created. Everything that we have, somebody thought about it, conceived it. It's amazing. We get into this aluminum tube and fly through the air at five, six hundred miles an hour because somebody thought about it and it works. So, Angela, don't worry about it. We're trying to get Angela on a plane. She's going to go. But we are all endowed with creative abilities because we are the result of a blueprint called God that creates galaxies on his days off. So I'm nobody's accident. I'm not a biological burp. I'm not the result of some amoeba that became a paramecium and crawled out of some slimy pit somewhere and all of a sudden sprung legs. I'm not the offspring or the the 19th generation of some monkey that swung from some tree somewhere. I am a son of God. We are children of the Most High God. One of the reasons why people act the way they are is they're told that they are not from any higher source. That's why I love this. I'm going I'm I'm to burn a hole in your forehead for a moment here. So stick with me. I had a chance to do some research so I'm going to get into your intellect a little bit here as I introduce you to something that you may have heard about, deoxyribonucleic acid. You know it as, together, D and A. What an amazing creation of God. DNA is amazing. Let me give you some facts about DNA. DNA is a molecule that carries the genetic instructions used in the growth, development, functioning, and reproduction of every known living organism. That is bugs, plants, flowers, birds, snakes. That's right. Everything that moves, everything that lives, everything that breathes, all have DNA. Deoxyribonucleic acid. Let's say that together. Deoxyribonucleic acid. When you go to Walmart, wow somebody with that word. How's your deoxyribonucleic acid doing? Excuse me, what aisle is that in? God is amazing. But let's keep going because when I studied, and I am not a scientist, but I want to tell you, when I started finding out about this, I found this gigantic hole Jasmine, I kept going deeper and deeper to come to appreciate how God made me. Look at this. Every human shares 99% of their DNA with every other human. The 1% difference is so unique that scientists can isolate the likelihood of you being present at the scene of a crime. Isn't that amazing? Have you heard of all these unsolved mysteries? until DNA came along. And police officers had gone back to many unsolved mysteries, and they found a piece of gum with somebody's saliva on it. Decades later, a Q-tip, a glass that somebody handled. God has created us so uniquely that just lifting your fingerprints off of a glass 
can eliminate the possibility of you being or not being there. And just a hair follicle from your brush or from your comb, or they could go into your car and just take some samples of your dry skin from your steering wheel and determine whether or not you did commit the crime or didn't, because as is the case of the blood of Abel, when the Lord says, your brother's blood cries to me from the ground, God was saying to Cain, his blood is so unique that you can't hide him even though you bury him. Because God put in the human blood something that is so amazing. When you look at this statistic, no wonder Dr. Luke writes these words in Acts 17, 26. The Bible says, And he has made, that is, God has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. That's why each one of us should love everybody else. Because if you turn around, the person sitting next to you has 99% of the DNA that you have, regardless of their skin color, their country of origin, their language. Somebody could speak Russian, and we share 99% of the same DNA. Or Spanish, and we still share 99% of the DNA. So you might ask yourself the question, what about, what, what, what about that other 1%? What's that for? Well, let's continue. DNA... A parent and a child share 99.5% of the same DNA. So with that last 1% left, half of that goes to your children. So Lani, your son, is a 99.5. But Mark, sorry, you're just a 99. So as close as you are to Lani, her son has a closer physiological deoxyribonucleic connection than you will ever have. When you have a child... The parent, 2.5%, 2.5%, and it goes to the child, 5.5%. 0.25% combined, 0.5%. So your child, the child that you both have, has more DNA that connects you to her than the person sitting on the same aisle with you. But let's go on further, because I want to kind of I want you to go home later and need to take a, a rest because I want to get into your head about how beautiful we are made. Scientists say that the human genome is, is the complete set of genetic instructions found in each cell. I want you to pay attention to this. Each genome contains all the information needed to build that organism and allow it to grow and develop. Now, while you're sitting here, there are explosions happening in your body. You don't feel it. But cells are dying, and cells are replacing those cells. Because every cell has instructions in it to, re to replace it. Every cell has instructions in it to say, when I die, make another one just like me. And God has programmed it so that the cells... Don't just die off and say, well, sorry, I can't replace you. Now, there's something that happens, and I'll talk about this later on, where we get rid of cells that cannot be replaced. But generally speaking, we have a human genome, and in that human genome is all the instructions we need. So, making that very simple, when you were created and you were in your mother's womb, and your father and your mother's cells got together to start creating a child. What was happening was all those instructions were consulting one another. Do this, do that. Fingers this length, hear that color. Arms this long, feet this big. And it was happening not by coincidence, but by God fearfully and wonderfully designing us. Matter of fact, scientists say, just to give you an idea about the human genome, they said, if you could type 60 words per minute, eight hours a day, the instructions are so detailed that it would take you 50 years to type the human genome. And by the way, just to make your head hurt, that's in one cell. Let's keep going. Each human cell has around six feet of DNA 
and each person, that's 60, if each person had 10 trillion cells, that would equal 10 billion miles of DNA in each human. I know, that just stopped your heart because you can't wrap your head around that. Now let, me, now let me mess you up. You don't have 10 trillion cells. Scientists suggest you have between 40 and 50 trillion cells. And let's add that up. Six feet of DNA in each cell times 40 to 50 trillion. And each cell has enough DNA that's six feet long. Curtis, don't try to figure it out. That is why scientists say if you put all the DNA molecules in your body end to end, the DNA would reach from Earth to the sun and back over 600 times. So don't go home and try to stretch that out because we won't see you for a long time. Is God amazing? And by the way, the reason why God didn't allow that to happen is because the reason why God doesn't stretch these genomes out, these, these DNA cells out, is because, can you imagine, I'm only six, two and a half, and there's enough DNA in one cell that if you stretch it out to six feet long, and I've got about 40 trillion cells, how tall will I be? Let's not try to figure it out. But only God can put six feet of DNA in a cell put 40 trillion cells in your body, and store it all in a six-foot-two frame. That should make you say, ah. That, we can't understand that. That's why David the psalmist says in Psalm 139, verse 14, I will praise you, for I am together fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. But I found one very interesting fact that explains to me why certain people behave the way they do. Because out of, out of all the things on the planet, you would not be able to guess what on the planet shares most of our DNA. And I won't ask you because you'll be here all day long. Let me just help you out. Humans and cabbage <laughs> share about 40 to 50% of the common DNA. That's why some people behave they are, the way they do. They just have a head of cabbage. <laughs> that may explain why some people behave the way they do. Because not, not monkeys, cabbage has more common DNA with us than any animal on the planet. That's amazing. When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God, why is that? And he might say, there are certain things about you that only I know. That's why you behave like a cabbage at times. <laughs> but when God established humanity, God gave the best health plan. We find this in Genesis 1, verse 29. And by the way, when we read this, keep this in mind. When God makes something, like when you buy these vehicles that are expensive, one of the reasons I don't buy those very, very expensive vehicles is because you have to put premium in there only. And who can afford premium gas when regular gas is expensive as it is? But people that buy those expensive vehicles put premium in it because the manufacturer says to do that. What did God say? Genesis 129. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for what? Food. So when God created Adam and Eve, when God created man, can you imagine we are thousands of years away from perfection? We haven't really seen a perfect peach. Brian, we haven't really seen a fully big orange. Brian loves oranges. We haven't really seen a perfect mango. And can you imagine what kind of fruit were existing, Ramona, when creation was perfect? 
Now we got all this stuff that's genetically altered just to try to produce it. Thousands of years removed from creation. However, something went wrong. You know, the entrance of sin brought terrible results. Adam lived 930 years and he died. And then shortly before the flood, to sustain humanity on the other side of the flood, God established a pattern. You see, before the flood, all the vegetables, all the fruits, all the grains, all the nuts, they were all there. Matter of fact, if you study further back, uh, archaeologists said before the flood, diamonds, diamonds were on the ground just like regular stones. You could pick up a diamond. Why? Because it was simply a part of God's creation. It had no particular value. It was a part of the creation. Walk around the street and say, hey, catch this, and it's a diamond. But God, to sustain humanity, knowing that all vegetation would be destroyed in the flood, he gave this command in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 2. And Noah said, as God instructed him, you shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female. And the logical question would be, what's God saying here? If I only take two of the unclean and we eat them on the ark, they won't, make it on the other, they won't be on the other side. But obviously God was saying, take more of the clean and less of the unclean. And many people don't know clean for what and unclean for what. Every now and then I drive down New Lake Road when I'm driving down I see a gigantic buzzard or crow. And we drove up the, our driveway the other day. We saw a beautiful big owl. He just stood there and went, beautiful. But they hunt. They are scavengers. They are God's sanitation department. God has a sanitation department on the land and in the sea, and praise God for that, because there's no sanitation department that I know that's going to go 20 or 30,000 feet in the ocean to keep the ocean clean. God says, I got that covered. When a deer gets hit, you could tell where the, you could tell where the deer is dead because you see the birds. They, God programmed them to look from the skies and see lunch. Don't go to Subway today. There's something on New Lake Road. And God intends for the buzzard, not us, to eat that. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 11, verse 3 and 4. And by the way, let me just share this with you. I don't take for granted that every Adventist knows this. Because I've seen some people rushed into the church, baptized before fully understanding and they bring into it the same habits they had prior to that. They don't understand the body temple and how God designed it and what God has for us and what God does not have for us. These are instructions that are not mosaic, but they are for the human body, period. Leviticus 11, verse 3 and 4. Leviticus 11, verse 3 and 4. Among the animals, the Lord said, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves and chewing the cud, that you may eat. Now, there are certain animals that don't have that. Like camels have a cloven, hood, cloven hoof. Pigs have a cloven hoof, but they don't chew the cud. You'll see it very carefully. Nevertheless, these you shall not eat among those that chew the cud or those that have cloven hooves. They have to have both. Chew the cud and have cloven hooves. And the Lord says, the camel, because it chews the cud, but does not have cloven hooves, it is what? Unclean to you. So it chews the cud, stores it, brings it back up, but it doesn't have cloven hooves. And so we see that the Lord made it very, very clear. When we follow the Bible, there are certain animals that God says, these are okay for consumption, but these are not. And let me put a little, let me put a little asterisk right here. 
It's hard to find anything today among this list that we can consume that's clean. I felt so bad the other day when we were driving down 57 and I saw all these little piggies sticking their nose right through the little holes. And I thought, hmm, here they come, Burger King. Here they come, Wendy's. So sad. They're on their way to be slaughtered, to end up on somebody's BLT. Somebody somewhere told somebody to put bacon on everything. Have you noticed that? Lettuce and tomatoes, BLT. No, just give me lettuce and tomatoes. Don't eat any bacon on it. That's the only animal that they eat from end to end, from the nose to the tail. That's the only animal. They eat everything. They don't throw away anything. No. I remember growing up in a West Indian home. Don't get sick. We used to eat cow tongue. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I meet people in southern Illinois that eat anything. There was a guy come to our house to work on our, in our yard, and he pointed to a red squirrel on our deck, and he said, you ever ate a red squirrel? Them some good eating. <laughs> Leave my red squirrel alone. That's Rocky. I feed him every day. <laughs> I like my squirrel. My wife don't like squirrels because they eat the bird food. I said, honey, they, want, they need food just as badly as the birds do. And at night, last night, I heard a sound on the, on the balcony, and I looked out, there were two little cute raccoons eating, eating black oil seeds. Y'all better leave those raccoons alone. They're God's creatures. If you don't want to feed them, don't put stuff out there. But he looked at me like to say, please don't stop me. And I said, go ahead, go ahead and eat. God didn't make raccoons to be eaten, neither squirrels. And the instruction continues. The coney, though it chews the cud, does not have a spit hoof, it is unclean for you. The rabbit, though it chews the cud, does not have a split hoof. It is unclean for you. And the pig, though it has a split hoof completely divided, does not chew the cud. It is unclean for you. Thank you. Coney is a rabbit. Thank you, honey. You could get a pig, give him a bath, spray it with perfume or cologne, depending on its agenda, put a red, red ribbon around it, but the moment you let that chain loose, it's going to go behind Walmart. There's a pig looking for his daily lunch. There's only one word to describe a pig. A pig. There is no other word. They are designed by God to do what they do. A rattlesnake can bite that pig and he'll go on his way because his vein system is not built like a human system. It'll go right to our circulatory system and paralyze us. A pig said, what was that? Oh, how you doing? And he just continues eating whatever he's eating. And if it's dead or alive, if it's by an outhouse or by a, a dump, he'll eat it. Because God designed the pig to be responsible for keeping the neighborhood clean. Amen for pigs. You could have a pig pet, but don't eat it. Because a pig is just like a dog. Don't eat the dog either. And the instruction continues. What about sea creatures? Deuteronomy 14, verses 9 and 10. These you may eat of all that are in the waters. You may eat all that have together what? Fins and scales. And whatever does not have fins and scales, you shall not eat. It is unclean for you. Now we live in southern Illinois. You've heard me say that. People love catfish out here. One guy I met said he goes fishing without a fishing rod. He just puts his hand in the water close to the bank and goes like this. And 
He says, to put some food in his hand. He says, the catfish is going to bite it. He's going to take that catfish home. He uses his arm as the bait with some food in his hand. The reason why catfish likes to be in mud because it's eating the filth of all the other fish to keep the waters clean. Shark, don't eat shark. Dolphin, if it doesn't have fins and scales, the Bible says we should not eat it. That's why here's a picture of the things that we shouldn't eat. Some of you don't know about it. Now, to be honest with you, I had lobster once when I, before I was, I was growing up in a home where, you know, we had Adventists and non-Adventists, and I went with a non-Adventist dad to Connecticut, and they went to a seafood restaurant, and they brought me lobster, and I tried it. I got as sick as a dog. You got the lobster, you got the clams, the oysters, the crab, the shrimp. That's God's sanitation department. That's why their shells are hard, so they could store in their garbage cans things that don't kill them. They are designed to hold toxins. If you eat those toxins, it gets into your bloodstream, and you wonder why you're fighting with what you're fighting with, because you're eating garbage in animals that were designed for garbage. Now, let's follow that. You wonder why the oceans are getting dirtier, because we're taking all of the shrimps and lobsters and crabs and oysters out of the ocean. They are there to clean the ocean. You're getting rid of the sanitation department, wondering why the ocean is getting filthier. Because it's all about money. Here's, here's what's not on God's menu. Lobsters, crabs, catfish, clams, shrimp, oysters, eels, and all shellfish, swordfish, sharks, pigs, camels, frogs, all squirrels, rabbits, horses, dogs, and cats. That's just an abridged list. Oh, there's something I forgot to put on that list. The mouse. The mouse. Don't eat the mouse. Now, you might think this is a joke, but in some countries, you can order fried rats. This is common in Asia. Oh, yeah. Go on YouTube and look at those videos where they just grab them, cut them in two, and throw them in the pot. I'll change the slide so you vegetarians don't die. <laughs> but this is a delicacy in certain parts of the world. I was in Singapore. I was shocked to see what's on the stand. They had seahorse. Everything that was in the ocean, they had it right there for sale. And whether in some places you could eat a live roach or a dead roach, depending on how you wanted it in your soup. And they say if you're a real man, you eat it while it's alive. That's in Korea. Anyway. Chocolate-covered ants, all the, the list goes on and on. Why does God prevent us from eating these things? The psalmist David says in Psalms 84, verse 11, No good thing will he withhold from those who walk how? Uprightly. When you walk right, you live right. That's why he says in his word in Psalm 84, verse 11, Beloved, actually this is 3 John 1, 2. 3 John 1, 2. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul does what? Prosperous. You can't, can't, eating a saddle like that, you won't end up in an emergency room. You really won't. And my wife makes some of the best salads. But some people don't eat salads. They don't realize that salads are God's natural steel wool for the body. It scrubs the intestines. It scrubs the corpuscles, the, the vessels. It goes through there and, and just sh 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 cleans it all up so that you could be healthy. So when you eat, include salads. And the bigger, the better. But now some people read that and say, well, you know what? But didn't God, didn't God make it okay to eat anything? It's amazing that some people try to get God to say what God never said. And one of those examples is the vision of Peter. Because I had somebody once say to me, what about Peter's vision? Let's go to Acts chapter 10. Let's see something. Acts chapter 10. Let's see what God says. Some people try to use this. Like one of my elders said to somebody once who was using this, he said, don't stop there, keep reading. When you stop, you can make any doctrine up. Acts chapter 10, let's look at this together. 
starting verse 9 to 13. <clears throat> the next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, that's about noon, and he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And while he's in this trance, verse 11 says, and saw heaven opened, and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, came to him rise, Peter, kill and eat. And right there is where most people stop. I've had pastors and people of other denominations, see, God said we could eat it. That's, that's not God. He said, did God say that Peter could eat that? I said, yes, he did. So that's why I'm eating it. Don't stop there. It's important as you read the story, the response of Peter. Look at verse 14 to 16. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And he was a fisherman. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, what God has cleansed you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. And somebody would say, see, God kept telling him, eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it. And they would say, as one person said, God don't have to tell me three times, that's why I'm eating it. No, that's not what the issue was. God was trying to remove something that existed among the apostles, among the Jews. The Jews wouldn't mix with the Gentiles. They had no communication with people of other races. And God was getting Peter ready for an expanding ministry. And Peter had to learn that the ideology he came from could not exist if God is going to reach every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So about that time when Peter woke up, he woke up and he was invited. There was a knock to the door. He was invited to a man's house by the name of Cornelius. Cornelius was a Gentile, but he was a godly man. But because of prejudice, this actually happened in those days, Jewish leaders accompanied some of these apostles when they went on their visits just to make sure that they were not fraternizing with the Gentiles. Can you imagine that? So they went to see whether or not Peter was legitimately going on a visit. And then the Bible made it very clear as to what, in fact, was happening. So when Peter arrived at Cornelius' house, and he was elated that Peter had arrived, because Peter, representing the gospel, comes to the house of a Gentile, and they immediately felt unworthy. But notice, God had taken care of that. Look at Acts 10, verse 28. God had already preempted Peter's mindset. He said to them, Peter saying to the occupants of Cornelius' household, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Can the church say amen? That's why it troubles me with this political rhetoric today, how we are villainizing certain races on this planet. You can't be a Christian and do that. Because God says there's nobody common or unclean in the eyes of the Lord. That's why the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 3, verse 28, in Christ there is neither, what? Jew nor Gentile, Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all, how? One in Christ Jesus. Make sure that when you meet a person, regardless of their races, regardless of what they're wearing, that they are a child of God or a potential child for the kingdom. Don't treat them like, oh, I don't want to be around him. Look at how he dressed. Look at how they dress. Look at what they smell like. Look what they look like. Oh, you can't, you can't help somebody that you can't hug. You can't help somebody that you can't get close to. Let the Jesus in you rub off on them so that the Jesus that's in you that loves them as they are 
Let the Jesus in you change them. Don't you try to do that. Because some people say, oh, I don't want to be around that person. When you, when you clean up, no, no, no. God finds us as we are, but praise God, he changes us. You see, the truth is complex. Our bodies are complex, but God is the owner, and he gives us specific instructions. Now, something else is happening. Something else is happening in the church that I never thought would happen. We lived in, on the West Coast, and in California, I'm saddened to say this, but there's some Adventist Christians that think it's okay to drink wine and alcohol. And it's not just in California. It's starting to permeate the mindset of different people around the, around the country. There are some churches where you can smoke and drink and do whatever you want. I don't want to be very, I don't want to make people feel uncomfortable, but there are certain clergy that smoke and drink. And there are certain churches that give alcohol for communion service, but not Adventists. I was pastoring a church in the Northern California Conference, my first real church. Well, I always wanted... We rented the church out on Sunday, and I won't mention the denomination. But I, one Sunday morning, I remember I forgot something in church, and I went to the back door in the fellowship hall to get it. When I opened the back door, I got hit with a wall of alcohol. I felt like I just stepped into a, an alco- a, a, a liquor store. And like, what is that? And I followed the smell to the sanctuary, and they had the communion set up for church that day. It was the kind of communion, Mary Kay, that you could not attend. Because as a former, as an AA member, you got away from that, you would have gone right back that day. You can't use alcohol to represent Jesus. He's the lamb without blemish and without spot. So what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about wine and alcohol? The Bible is clear. The Bible is clear. If you believe your body belongs to the Lord, here's what the Bible says, Proverbs 20 and verse 1. The wise man Solomon says, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whoever is deceived thereby is what? Not wise. Why can God say that? Because your body belongs to him. He goes on further, Proverbs 23, verse 31 to 33. The Lord says, do not look on wine when it is red. That's when it's hitting the fermenting stage. When it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly, at the last it bites like a serpent and stings like a what? Viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will, perver- will utter perverse things. That's why people say, I don't know what I said. What did I do yesterday? Man, I was, I tell you too much about my life. I got to cut that out. I was a casual drinker. What does that mean? I didn't buy alcohol. I never bought beer, never bought a bottle of whiskey. I would only drink when I went to parties. I was one of those guys that drink those sophisticated drinks, like slow gin fizz and tequila sunrise. You hide the alcohol in the sweetness. Anybody got delivered from that? Come on, help me out, somebody. You all couldn't have been born holy. I got delivered from that. But we had, we had tenants in our house in Brooklyn, and we had a man, Kenneth Carter, he was Barbadian. He had a strong Barbadian accent. One day, my, my dad and I are sitting in the, in the kitchen, and we hear, what was that? We went out in the backyard, and Carter was so drunk he walked out the window and fell three stories. Landed on the chute in the backyard that they used to open up to deliver coal to the boiler. Thank the Lord he didn't land on the concrete. He got up uninjured. Fell three stories. Scared us to the third floor and back. We went outside. Oh, we heard in the dark one. Papa said, who is that? He turned his flashlight on. It's Carter. It didn't knock him out. He didn't break a bone. That's what happens to people that are inebriated. They get into their cars, kill a whole family, and they walk away unscathed. You know why? Because the effect of alcohol on the body, it relaxes everything. And they're like a gigantic jellyfish. And they are so moldable and pliable that there's no tension there. They just... And he was saying stuff that didn't even make any sense. 
Let me share some statistics with you about this. We had a guy, I don't know, I'm, I'm looking back on this, honey, my wife and I talk about this. My father rented rooms to a lot of drunk people. We had a man that, was, we heard noise one day, we were just about to go on a church picnic on Saturday night, we heard this noise in the front yard. One of the guys was sleeping in my mother's garden. His name was Biven. What does that sound? So my dad, to fix that, he cut all the bushes down. It was just amazing. I survived all that. Thank you for not saying amen. What about alcohol? What about alcohol? According to the carbon treatment centers, they deal specifically with issues of alcohol. They said alcohol, also known as ethanol or ethyl alcohol, is a psychoactive drug that acts as a central nervous system depressant. They continue, alcohol interferes with communication between nerve cells, these beautiful DNA cells that God took the time to design, and all other cells, and affects various centers in the brain. Even moderate consumption of alcohol causes immediate effects such as lowering inhibitions. That's why guys like to get girls drunk before they abuse them. Increasing relaxation and dulled senses. Well, what about alcohol in moderation? Because some people say, hey, everything in moderation. They didn't leave this out. Alcohol in moderation, heightened emotional response, lack of coordination, poor balance, slurred speech, dizziness, disturbed speech or disturbed sleep, nausea and vomiting. What about alcohol in stages? Relaxation, euphoria, excitement, confusion, stupor. Why would you put in your body something that has all those effects? Then it goes on further. What about the short-term impact of alcohol on the stomach? Alcohol irritates the stomach and intestine lining and increases stomach acid secretion. This causes vomiting. That's why people throw up the next day. They continue. What about the effect on the skin? Alcohol increases blood flow to the skin, causing users to sweat and appear flushed. And what about the muscles? Alcohol reduces blood flow to the muscles, causing muscle ache, most notably felt as the alcohol leaves the system. This effect is often called what? Hangovers. And you know what? Millions of dollars are being put into helping people detox, get away from alcohol. But the, but the industry that is only thinking about money, they find other creative ways. That's why don't worry about just the hard drinks. Avoid wine coolers. Can somebody say amen? They try to find these creative ways. I made a mistake one day and bought a wine cooler. Didn't know because it has great flavor. You know, watermelon. I thought, oh, I need a watermelon drink, watermelon drink right now. I popped that thing open in the car. I went, what is that? It had a sting to it. My wife and I were in Napa Valley when we lived in California, and we drove people around. We had family members. They said, let's go to Napa Valley. I was the designated driver. So one day we decided, just the two of us, to go, and we went to a winery. We said, now, do you have any non-alcoholic grape juice? They said, of course we do, because we get Martinelli's, but we wanted to get something esoteric, you know, like from Napa Valley. So we got some Zinfandel peach and grape, and they said, it's non-alcoholic. We said, okay, okay, the grape and the, you know, peach. We got home on special occasion, opened up the peach and a little bit of ice and started drinking it, and we started smiling unnecessarily. <laughs> <laughs> honey, honey, the meal is really good tonight. What did you put in it? Two percent alcohol. <laughs> Just that two percent sent me bonkers. <laughs> now you know I could have said, "Nah, ain't nobody in church gonna know about this." <laughs> so let's just go ahead and get rid of this because we paid like seventeen dollars for this thing. Let's just no. We stopped. We stopped immediately and said, "No, this is not going to continue." Amen? Amen. So avoid those drinks that seem to be. Like innocuous, and uh, it's not a big deal. It's only 2%. Now, in New York City, we had winos that could not afford to buy alcohol. You know what they bought? NyQuil, because it has 25% alcohol. 
We had people that got drunk off of NyQuil. You got to watch out today. Understand what you're putting in your body. You know, when Jesus was on the cross, he made a decision. When John the Baptist was being born, God gave instruction about John the Baptist. Look at the instruction that he gave. Luke 1, verse 15. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither what? Wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Okay, you got the wrong spirits, or you have the Holy Spirit. And the two don't live in the same place. That's why when Jesus was on the cross, I'm winding up now, when Jesus was on the cross, when he was on the cross and he was dying, he said, I'm thirsty. They tried to give him cheap Romans wine to drink. And what does the Bible say? Mark 15, verse 23. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. Who's our example? Now, so far, most of you have been to say, hey, I want I don't have to worry about anything that he said. So let me talk about the preferred drug for Adventists. <laughs> you thought I forgot, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Avoid harmful stimulants. We live in a, we live in a, a Starbucks generation. I'm going to stand right behind this just in case stuff starts flying up here. Because, you know, Adventists don't like us to step on their little babies. This is a Starbucks generation. But we don't understand. I'm going to invite my good friend, Dr. Jonathan Sewell, to come one day and just do a seminar on the effects of caffeine. He was a caffeine addict. He's a neurosurgeon, and he said, I can tell you stuff about caffeine that will make your hair stand up. He studied this scientifically and medically. But just some of the short negative effects of Caffeine on the body increases your blood pressure. Brain, it affects your brain. The dosages, skin, kidney stones, stomach, the acid that's secreted into your blood system, into your stomach, where you get either ulcers or gallstones. The liver, it doesn't easily get rid of caffeine. Caffeine depletes calcium if you... That's why when people, some people get older, they have osteoporosis because they've been drinking caffeine all their lives. My brother's girlfriend can't start the day without caffeine. She has a search that says, don't talk to me. I haven't had my coffee yet. And she means it. It increases cholesterol buildup in the system. And if you take vitamins, you might as well stop it if you drink coffee because it depletes the vitamins. That's just a nutshell. So if you, if you tend to be one of those people that have all the different styles, and nowadays you don't just get basic coffee, you got latte this and latte that, and mocha latte this and all that, like you got all this lackadaisical stuff that the devil's trying to find creative ways to make money and mess up your body temple, and you wonder when you get older. When you're young, it doesn't affect you as quickly, but when you get older and you look back and you say, man, a lot, why are my bones breaking so easily? And then people take vitamins while they drink coffee, thinking that they could take calcium to help it out, and the calcium says, not so fast. You go straight out. I live here. Study it. Quickly, doesn't even need a science project for this one. Smoking comes under the category of what? Say it together. Thou shall not click kill. That includes yourself. Exodus 20 and verse 13. What is the principle as I close? Let me invite the praise team to come up. What is the principle that I am communicating with you today, my brethren? This is the principle. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, are we not, my brothers and sisters? And the Apostle Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your what? Reasonable service. You never knew that your body is where church service happens. Right? Did you ever know that the Lord has your body? He conducts his services in your body. You come to church for service. God says, I want service to happen in your body. That's my temple. I want to live there. 
And he's so serious about that. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? How serious is he? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is what? Holy, which temple you are. I could put clothes on it. I could run with it. But I, does, this doesn't belong to me. I'm learning that I have to treat this body the way that God wants me to. Why? Because it's not just about health. He says, if you keep it up, if you keep ignoring my principles for a healthy life, when he says, I'll destroy you, he will remove his protecting care. God cannot give you health if you insist on unhealthy practices. He's not going to just zap you and knock you out on the next turn on the freeway. He said, I can't help you. And some people, Ellen White talks about this. I'll share some quotations in the next series. Servant of the Lord says, when you pray for people that are knowingly violating their body temple, it will accomplish nothing. Because they are practicing that which is debilitating and destroying to their temple. She says, don't pray for such a one until they are willing to abandon those practices because it will avail absolutely nothing. And on all, all the heels of all this, Iris, sometimes it's not what you're eating, sometimes it's what's eating you. Right? Sometimes it's not, not what's going in, but what's coming out. So lastly, let's all say this together. Are you ready, church? 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Let's put some month into this. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, do how much? all to the glory of God. How many of you want to aim for the ideal? Now, you may get there, but if you don't get there, you got to move in the direction where your health is becoming, where your life is becoming, where your mind is becoming. One of the reasons we can't receive impressions of the Spirit of God because we're clogged. That's why Daniel said, I'm not going to defile myself and Daniel was 10 times wiser, the Hebrews 10 times wiser because they chose not to defile themselves. This is your receptor, your antenna. God wants to get to this, but he can't get to it if it's clogged. My brethren, I pray that you now undertake a journey where you start rebuilding the temple. Is that your desire? Why don't you stand with me as we sing this closing hymn? We got to go in the direction that God wants us to go and build on the plan of God. Let's sing this together. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy what are we building on? On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand When darkness seems to fail its faith I rest on His unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the Why? On Christ the solid rock that stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Let's make an oath and covenant. His oath is covenant and blood supports me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all mine. Let's raise that chorus on who? On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking Now the coming of the Lord When he shall come with trumpet sound Oh, may I then in him be found And in his righteousness alone 
Just before I pray, I told you this is part of my journey. I haven't reached the ideal yet, but I'm moving it. I've turned my car around because I want to be healthy. I don't want pains that I can't explain and feelings that I don't know where they're coming from. Because, you know, the older you get, we start making excuses for the things that we've done for years. And we fail to realize it finally caught up with us. My brother and my sisters, start, you young folk. Say, praise God for this message. You could start now. Some of us start when we're 50 and 60 years old. Some of you young folk, you live healthy, your body will take care of you. I can still play basketball. 91 years old, still play basketball. Not really, I'm a lot younger than that. But here's my point. I don't take joint medication, nothing. If you live right, your body will bless you. But you cannot ignore God's plan and expect God to bless you. Who wants to covenant with me today to say, I'm moving in God's direction. I want to be what God knows I can be. I want to be that heavenly Lamborghini that can shift gears and keep going. <laughs> Father in heaven, your people, you made us. You designed us. You know what's best for us. Sometimes we take detours and, yes, we get that barbecue chips every now and then or the late night five bowls of ice cream. We just don't understand temperance. Some of us overdo things that are not a red light. And then the negative effects come in. Our health begins to wane and we wonder what medication we can take and even the doctors cannot reverse it. So Lord, help us to recognize the great physician. You have already given us a plan. If we would simply follow it, we will be healthier, wiser, more fit vessels to go forth and labor in your vineyard. So Lord, guide us, give us a focus on the ideal and help us take those steps to move toward the high, the, the high calling for health and wellness in Christ Jesus. And we want to glorify you, Lord. We want you to dwell within us. We want you to come and live there without fear of any competing spirits. Give us that willingness, we pray. And may you be glorified May we do all things to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said, amen.